Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to everybody. Yes, uh, welcome to everybody who is joining us for the MBLEX review class. My name is Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor. And today we are talking about client assessment. Do, 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 do. Yeah, client assessment. So this is your ability to think, um, your ability, they test your ability to critically think, to assess. That's what client assessment is really looking to do. Uh, and today our class is going to go in three parts. Our first part is going to be a new strategy on taking the MBLEX because what you will find is that this test is not just about knowledge. This test is also about test taking strategy. And we put that test taking strategy into place um, at the end of class. So we're gonna talk about a strategy so that you get to know the, the test a little bit better. You get to know the process of testing. Some of you have already tested and so you know the process. Uh, however, there are strategies that we can use that will improve our um, chances to pass, improve our probability to pass. In fact, when we don't use these test taking strategies, the probability goes up that we won't pass. And that's not because you don't know your stuff. That's not because you're not a great massage therapist. Honestly, we need to learn how to take a test along with knowing the knowledge, knowing how to safely practice. And that's what we're gonna to cover today. So in the first part of class, we'll talk about the strategy, uh, uh, getting to know that test a little bit better. Uh, we're also going to talk, there we go, a little brighter. Uh, then we're gonna go over some content, client assessment, what is it, what do we need to know? We're gonna review a bunch of that. And at the end, we're gonna dissect some questions. So let's get started. And the thing where the strategy we're going to talk about today uh, is what to do, controlling what you can control. And I call that game day preparation. So if a football team uh, has a game, uh, they don't just uh, show up, no uniforms, no practice, no strategy, don't know their opponent. No, football teams prepare. And they prepare by doing the fundamentals. They prepare by having a game day strategy. And that's what I want to share with you today is the game day strategy. Any of you guys out there, athletes? And maybe you didn't play football, but maybe you watch football. I think you may understand the term of game day preparation. And so we control what we can control on game day. What's your game day? Your game day is the day you take the MBLEX. Yeah, the day you take the MBLEX, we have a strategy. And I want to mentally prepare you for your next test, because you're all here listening to this, because you're gonna have a game day. You're gonna go have, you're gonna go take the MBLEX at some point. And so what's your game day strategy? Part of that is controlling what you can control, getting a good night's sleep, preparing, right? So we're learning today. We're going to go through some material where we learn, um, but learning in a strategic way, doing meaningful homework. If you don't feel like you're doing meaningful homework, reach out to me. I'll give you some. <laughs> Watch these videos. You'll, that's good homework. But doing meaningful homework, preparing your brain by not only learning, but by resting, getting good rest, getting good rest the night before. You might be nervous. It's okay. It's not going it, to look, even if you don't sleep a wink the day before your test, you're still going to do fine. Nothing is going to sabotage you. Mm -mm. Nothing's going to sabotage you. And know that everything is working for you. I know you're coming up against some tough stuff. I just spoke with someone who, um, I believe I had a, a knee replacement. Holy mackerel. It's going to be about six weeks until they can actually stand on that. That could be an interruption or it could be seen as an interruption or it could be seen as a gift. What if that 
surgery, that accident, that job loss, that that thing that seemed like, oh, that seemed to be against you actually showed up for you. Know that it's part of your game day prep, positive thinking, everything is happening for me. Moving into game day, get there early. You're going to need to be at your testing center, at the Pearson View Testing Center, 30 minutes prior to your test, a minimum. Get there 45 minutes early. Plan to be there an hour early. Drive the route at the time of day you're taking your test prior to going. If you don't know where you're going, go find it. Practice. No game day surprises. Nothing new on game day. No new socks, no new hat, no new glasses. Nothing new on game day. Yeah. Okay. Game day, you know you're going to need to be there 30 minutes early. And what are you going to eat? What are you going to, um, what are you going to wear? You know that you have to put all of your items, all of your personal items into that little cubby and they're going to lock it. Yeah. And so just walk through this in your imagination. That's called game day prep. How are you going to celebrate? That's another thing for game day. Think about how you're going to reward yourself. Who are you going to call? Yeah. Who are you going to celebrate with? Are you going to have an ice cream? Are you going to go for a great meal? Um, are you going to have a toast of champagne? Are you going to take a weekend and do a getaway? Are you going to go to a mountain cabin and hike as a reward? What's your reward? Because that's also part of game day prep. Regular rewards are important. Regularly rewarding yourself keeps you inspired, keeps you motivated. And so little rewards along this journey are also very helpful. Control what you can control. Are you driving yourself? Is someone driving you? Have them drive you the, ahead of time. Know the, tra know the traffic, right? Know the weather. These are all parts of game day prep because we want to control what we can control because we know we're going to feel a little nervous. It's normal to feel nervous. It doesn't mean you have, you're not fully prepared. You're about to become someone you've never been before. Someone who passed the emblem. That can be, you know, that can be a little nervous. That can be exciting. That can be scary. It's okay. Let's walk through it in our mind's eye. Walk through finishing the test, breathing during the test, going up to that counter, getting that piece of paper, and it says pass. Oh, yeah. All right. So that is my strategy for you for today in preparing for the MBLEX, controlling what you can control, having good game day prep. Yeah. Controlling what you can control. You know, there's going to be something that's out of your control. It's okay. But we take care of what we can take care of to put us in the best position to be mentally and physically ready to take the test. All right. Speaking of mentally and physically ready, you ready to do a, learn a little learning? A little learning? <laughs> All right. This is part two of our class where we get to do a little learning. All right. Do, 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 don't be scared. Those are these are all test questions. Yes. So today we are talking about client assessment. Client assessment has to do with assessing why your client has shown up for a massage. This section of the Emblex. Um, is uh, about 17%, I thought I said that on the next slide, about 17%. So we have 100 questions. That means 17 of which uh, are going to be on client assessment, some form. And so understanding your ability to think critically, 
uh, to, uh, to implement your critical thinking, to assess contraindications to massage, to know if that's, and we'll talk about that in class today, contraindications. All right, but let's, I wanna say a quick thank you uh, to the MBLEX guide uh, for some of the content I'm using today. I uh, also wanna say thank you to Quizlet Plus for some of the inspiration for the questions today. Uh, those are great resources for us as we uh, prepare for the, uh, the MBLEX, as well as this class. So, oh, here's that slide. Yes, 17%. And this is directly from the Federation of State Massage Therapy Board's content outline. So you apply to take your test at the FSMTB. This comes right from them. This is what you'll be tested on. So how do you organize your session? What type of consultation and evaluation will you do? How are you collecting your data? And how are you keeping notes? Are you prepared to do a visual assessment, whether that's a general assessment or a postural assessment and knowing what those are? Um, do you palpate during your assessment? And what is that and when is it appropriate? Uh, do you know what range of motion is? Um, and again, that clinical reasoning, um, how to rule out contraindications, how to set goals for your clients, treatment planning, uh, those types of things. Yeah. Thinking about that, huh? It's getting a little bit real in here, huh? Yeah, client assessment. So let's talk first about the organization of the body work session. And that can be made up. So the organization of your assessment, um, you are going to include a lot of different things in this assessment. Uh, An assessment continues on during your session, right? How many times have we heard a client say, um, that, uh, oh, I didn't know it hurt there. Yeah, yeah, so so we continually are assessing as we go along, but uh, classic parts of your assessment are gonna be your health intake form, the discussion you have uh, around the client's current condition. You may use range of motion, um, you may use postural assessment, um, and depending on what type of setting you are in, you may even see vital signs, maybe. Um, a client assessment, the initial assessment, is a little bit more lengthy than later assessments, right? Because it's your first time you're seeing that health intake form. And so that could be um, up to 15 minutes, depending on that client's health history. Uh, but it could be just a few minutes if this is a regular client. The client assessment happens with every session. I don't care if you've worked with them twice a week, every week for six months. I've got a client like that. Twice a week, every week. Every time. I'm like, how are you feeling? What's going on with your body? What's new? That client has an extensive health history. And sometimes there's new things. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Having an, endo an endo um, endoscopy. Oh, new symptoms. Right? And we're going to talk in a little bit about new symptoms versus new signs or signs versus symptoms. But these are all components of your client assessment. So, what's the order of these things? Well, classically, we're going to do the client interview, we're going to do the health intake, then we're going to do a visual assessment, and then we're going to do some palpation. Let's talk first about the health history. So, we'll have a form, right? A health history form. Every client signs a health, uh, fills out a health history form. Every client, yes, every client. Uh, at times when I see clients at their home, uh, I have in the past, I have skipped this. I forget to send it to them. I forget to bring a blank one. We're feeling kind of rushed. Every time I have skipped a health history form, there has been some condition that has popped up. I told you, I, I mean, you may have listened to the uh, video about I'm massaging my client's head at the end. And I feel like a weird lump. This is this client I'm seeing at her home. She was in her robe when I arrived. I, you know, I had to set up my table. Like she's just standing and looking at me. So I didn't do a written health history. At the end of the session, I'm massaging her head and I say, 
oh, did you have an injury here? I, I feel like and it was a funny bump. It wasn't a dent. It was like a bump. She said, oh, that's probably where they did the craniotomy. She had had a tumor on her eye and they had to do a craniotomy. That might've been nice to know before I started. Always do a health history form. That's the point. There's a written health history, so written. And maybe if they um, have sloppy writing, you're gonna do this for them. Maybe you send it to them, you know, in electronic form, up to you, but always do a health history form. And on the MBLEX, you'll always be doing, as far as the questions are concerned, you always do a health history form. Uh, next, you may do a visual assessment. And so what is a visual assessment? It is uh, assessing visually what you see. Yeah, so you can see certain um, things about their posture. Are they balanced or imbalanced? Um, what is the condition of their skin? Are they have, you know, what's their body language? Yeah, so these are things that you can visually see. And they, let's take a look at this slide. This is a classic visual assessment. So this is a client who's come in for a massage. And what do you see? Let's take a look before we give you the answers. All right, you can see a little bit of the head turn here in the shoulder. See how this arm is different than the other arm? What do you notice about her knees? in relation to her hips. Look at the feet. Excellent, excellent example of a visual assessment. Take a look. All right. You can see that the head is turned just a little to her left. The shoulder is rounded on her left, bringing her torso forward. Both kneecaps are in, right? This could indicate weak hip muscles. It could also indicate um, weak and tight adductor muscles. Most, um, many, I shouldn't say most, many uh, clients have weak and tight adductor muscles. And the feet, the feet are here pointing out, could indicate tight hips, tight gluteal muscles. Now, we don't need to tell the client all this but we do benefit from seeing it and making a note of it. You may on the emblex see something like this and say, okay, both kneecaps are, are pointing um, in the, to, the, to the side, to inside. What does that indicate? And it'll give you a choice of a three or four answers on what this visual assessment might indicate. Also as a part of our assessment skills is palpation. And palpation is when we actually touch, when we palpate. This is a physical exam. Move us over here, there we go. And this is the type, palpation is often when a client says it hurts right here. We're gonna go ahead and, and palpate where that hurts. What are we looking for? We're looking for the tone of the tissue. We're looking for, does it move? What's the texture of the tissue? Um, what's the temperature of the tissue? Um, and we use our hands to assess that, it, oh, it hurts right here. Oh, it's not right here. It's right here. Oh, wait, no, it's not right here. It's right here. Because that client may say, oh, it's my bicep or it's my arm. Oh, it's my shoulder. The shoulder is a pretty complex joint, as we learned in the anatomy of the shoulder in one of our classes. Yes, so we palpate to get specific about where that um, client is hurting. Let's move us to the bottom, there we go. Uh, so uh, what does that look like? Um, so we will look for, we'll palpate. And what does it mean when we feel that this area is really hot compared to this area? Could be inflammation, right? 
Um, what do we feel when this area is cold and it hurts? Maybe it's a lack of circulation, ischemia. That lack of circulation is called ischemia. Um, healthy tissue moves, um, it glides, it slides, it doesn't feel stuck. Um, and this is all stuff we can um, assess with palpation. Palpation can be done on the table, but it, especially if it's your first visit with a client, your first session, maybe do some palpation off the table. That can also include um, assessing range of motion. Now, this can be done on the table, but depending on what your client wears, draping for range of motion uh, exams is a little tricky. I recommend if you're gonna look at range of motion, do it while they're clothed. There's also some special tests that can be part of a palpation um, assessment. And what you see here on the screen is called Thomas test. And we're looking at tight hip flexors. So we have the client lay with both their knees off the table. Again, depending on the age of your client, this is gonna be appropriate or inappropriate. Um, not like in an ethical way, but it's gonna be difficult or easy. And what we're looking for is tight hip flexors. So if your client is to bring their knee to the chest, but they can't keep their leg on the table, that's an indicator, a positive indicator that their hip flexors are tight because that whole pelvic girdle is moving. So these are interesting, right? It gives you a clue on where to work, how to critically think. Also, um, these range of motion tests, um, they test the, the, the movement, the rhythm. Is their rhythm smooth as they lift their shoulder? Or is it gunk, 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 Are there little bumps in it? <laughs> are there little catches? Great indicator that they're going to need some shoulder work. Or you can palpate to see where that's sore, where that's tender. And we can test after the session to look at improved range of motion, right? Before they started, they could only bring their arm, their shoulder to here. So keeping, keeping that shoulder stable, what is their range of motion? Because we can, are we lifting, is the client lifting their arm like this, that whole shoulder joint is moving? Or are they lifting their arm to test the range of the motion? Uh, palpation and range of motion exercises can be done standing up in gravity, or it can be done on the table and we consider that kind of out of gravity. Yeah. Uh, and there are three types of range of motion, passive, active, and active assisted. So passive, active, and active assisted. So passive range of motion means I'm moving you. I, as the massage therapist, am moving you. You're not helping. So that's that kind of that... Um, you need the ragdoll arm, the client has the ragdoll arm, and the massage therapist is lifting the arm. Active is when that client is actively moving their arm. Okay, so please go ahead, keeping your shoulder down, lift your, uh, lift your arm. If the client does this, we can assist, and that's called active assisted. So we may assist by saying, okay, I'm going to keep my finger on your shoulder and I'm going to help you raise your arm. Oh, it hurts right there. Great, we'll stop right there. So range of motion can be active, passive, or active assisted. All right, let's take a look at the difference between signs and symptoms. Uh, so signs versus symptoms. Signs we can see, like, I see that sign, that stop sign, I have to stop. That yellow light means caution. It's a sign. Um, yield, it's a sign. I can see it. Likewise in the body. A sign can be observed or detected. So it can be measured. It can be felt. So examples of this, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Um, so, uh, of course, vital signs, but uh, forward head posture. Um, you know, uh, um, a gate that is off. Uh, you might be able to see tissue firmness. 
we talked about uh, asymmetrical. Um, so you can see that this tissue is firm and this is, is lower, this is high and this is lower. Um, but symptoms are what your client uh, describes to you. Uh, symptoms are what your clients feel. And those are um, not objective. They are, what is the opposite of objective? I'm losing the word. Subjective. Thank you, subjective. <laughs> Thank you, subjective. So that's why we have in our notes, and we're going to go into soap notes here, subjective, objective. So symptoms are subjective, but they come from your client. So I am thirsty. Oh, my back is so itchy. Man, I'm always feeling tired. We can note those under subjective, but as um, a type of symptom. So let's move into critical thinking as it pertains to contraindications for massage. There are two types of contraindications for massage, local and general. Some call it specific and general. But one is an indicator that it is local. It is specific. It is in a specific area. General means it's affecting the whole body. Let's first look at local contraindications. So any skin conditions that are contagious, um, any skin conditions such as hives, a rash, psoriasis, any inflamed area, uh, poison ivy, um, so open wounds, varicose vein, athlete's foot, uh, these are all local contraindications, meaning we avoid the area. With poison ivy, it depends how badly they have it. Poison ivy is actually systemic and it can spread if we are to do massage. Even if we never touch the affected area, it is circulatory. And therefore, we have the potential to spread it. I have put it under the, the category of a local contraindication because we obviously I'm not gonna rub it. However, we, if we discover it during a session, we need to advise our clients that it could spread. If they are susceptible to poison ivy, we probably want to finish, we probably want to end the session. Because you know how, if you've ever had poison ivy, you know somehow it, sometimes it can jump. It's not contagious. You're not going to catch it, but it might jump. All right, just to be clear. The so psoriasis is not a, a general contraindication. It's a local contraindication, but it can be widespread. Now, plaque psoriasis is what normally people have. That's what this is called. Uh, and so we just basically want to avoid the area because it's not pleasant to rub. So this is a, an image of plaque psoriasis. One is on the uh, arms and one is on the back. And again, in this case with this female back, we could work the neck. We could work the shoulders. We just don't want to make it more itchy. And um, yeah, so it's a local contraindication compared to a general contraindication. General contraindication is defined as something that could we could make worse, that we could catch. It is potentially harmful. It's potentially dangerous. It is systemic and or dangerous. So general contraindications, uh, any fever, even nausea. We don't know why they're, they're nauseous. They could have a concussion. They could be pregnant. They, I mean, why are they nauseous? That is a general contraindication, meaning we shouldn't probably do the massage or we should wait to do the massage until that passes. Uh, less than 48 hours after chemo. We don't want to be doing massage immediately following chemotherapy. The theory of chemotherapy is that it actually stays in the system for a little while to help fight the cancer. So we don't want to flush that out too fast. Plus the patient is often feeling nauseous, is often feeling sick. 
It depends. Depends on, on what type of chemotherapy they're having. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, general contraindication. Appendicitis, go to the hospital, go to the emergency room. Um, concussion, we'll need a doctor's note. Uh, H1N1, COVID, uh, yeah, these are all general contraindications. Let's pause here for a moment because I'd like to talk to you about concussions. You may see questions on specific pathologies. Pathology is just a, a fancy way to say disease or disruption or a problem. Uh, but a concussion is a general contraindication because we don't know how bad this concussion is. How do you know someone's been in a car accident? Do, how do you know they have whiplash? We don't. How do you know they have a concussion? We don't. We need for them to see a doctor. This is out of the scope of our practice. I'm so sorry if you're coming in because you have a headache, because you got a ball hit to your head or you got punched or you were in a motor vehicle accident. We have to have a doctor's note. Otherwise it's a general contraindication. We can't do the massage. Concussion protocol. Uh, let's take a look at this. So what is a concussion? It's a brain injury. It's a, um, a, a, a blunt force to the cranium. And even minor concussions need to be taken seriously. They can occur uh, through sport, for recreation. They can occur by running into somebody, by bumping somebody, by bumping their head, by opening a cabinet, by being in a motor vehicle accident. It, it can actually cause a slight concussion. And people who have had concussions before are more, more vulnerable to concussions. And by treating it properly, we can help the brain to heal. Uh, so what are some of the signs of concussion? Uh, it can be dizziness, nausea, headache, um, being sensitive to light, feeling a little foggy, feeling confused. If we are treating someone, and this is actually part of your um, CPR training as well, uh, if we are in a situation where we're treating someone and we think they might have a concussion, uh, we can ask, say you're the massage therapist. I mean, while I was working as the massage therapist for DC United, uh, which is Major League Soccer in Washington, DC, we had one uh, one player, Eddie Pope, God bless him, a defensive player. Man, went up for a ball and man, crashed into the ball and the head of the other player. Eddie was brought to the sidelines and we asked him, Eddie, what day is it? Tuesday? No, it was Sunday. Um, Eddie, where are we? Um, Washington, D.C. No, we were in Los Angeles. We were at the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Good sign. Eddie's not straight. <laughs> so Eddie had to come out of the game. Um, do they feel like maybe they answer the questions properly, but they feel like they're going to be sick? Um, they feel like so we need to have that concussion protocol. And we see it a lot now in the NFL that they'll go through a concussion protocol sideline before they're cleared to come back for the game. Uh, so we do see this mostly in sport, um, but some of the post concussion symptoms, post concussion syndrome, it says here, but post concussion symptoms is they can have a headache, blurry vision, um, maybe their memory is not right. They're having a hard time concentrating or sleeping. They can feel dizzy. They can get a little bit of vertigo, which is they can't, you know, like they get really dizzy. Um, and maybe even in extreme cases, some personality changes. These are all symptoms that someone has had a bad concussion. They're not always present, but they're sometimes present. And you may be asked on the MBLEX, what are some signs of a concussion? That's where we come back to the dizziness, the nausea, the headache, light sensitivity, confusion, blurry vision. These are symptoms of post-concussion. So we did mention chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, what about cancer? Is cancer a contraindication for massage? It is not. It is an indication for massage. Studies of massage, here at see is the quote, Studies of massage for cancer patients suggest that massage can decrease stress, anxiety, depression, pain, and fatigue. 
Many healthcare professionals now recognize massage as useful, non-invasive addition to the standard medical treatment. Massage itself gives the client, or in this case, the cancer patient, um, a feeling of well-being. This is what we're going for. So cancer treatment is not a contraindication. Then this, uh, this uh, quote is from, let me show you, the uh, Arizona, Arizona Oncology, if you want to read a little bit more about that. All right. And, and so a client assessment uh, doesn't diagnose, uh, it doesn't treat, I mean, it doesn't diagnose an illness. It is a part of the treatment plan, but it's not the only treatment. Uh, so, and as I mentioned at the start of our class, assessment is an ongoing process. Uh, so we need to pay attention throughout the session because we start with an idea, right? This is, we're gonna, okay, client's chief complaint, low back pain. When we have them in a prone position, we assess, we palpate, there are traps, and their traps are super tight. We're going to do some work on those traps, but our client's main chief complaint, chief area, main interest in getting a massage, what motivated them to get a massage, low back pain. So we're going to treat that low back pain, but we're going to continue to assess where else, what else might be involved. Tight hip flexors, weak abdominal muscles. We're using our critical thinking. Maybe when we want to stretch those hip flexors, how do you stretch hip flexors in the prone position? Have you ever brought that client's, bent that client's knee and brought their foot towards their glutes? You're going to see a lot of different range of motion there at that knee. And we do need to ask, have there been any problems with the knee before we go yanking that foot back towards the butt? But to stretch a hip flexor, we could go ahead and bend that knee, bring that foot towards the butt as a part. Of, oh, okay, you know, I found this guy has a low, uh, a tight low back. So we're ongoing in our assessment process using our critical thinking. Something else that is a part of our assessment tools that you may be tested on at the Amblex uh, is what is gait analysis? So what is gait analysis? Have you heard of that before? Check my, let's see. Anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat yet. All right, what is gait analysis? So gait analysis, uh, oh, thank you. I see, here's some, see some feedback here. Yes, the way people walk, exactly. So we're analyzing the way someone walks. We can do that by watching them walk, that gait analysis. We also get a clue if we look at the bottom of their shoes. Um, did you do that in school? Um, yes, exactly, Melissa, how they swing their arms. Exactly, Kiara, yes, the way people walk. Um, yes, how they swing their arms. Are they swinging them side to side? Or are they swinging them front to back? Yes, and so here we see an overpronation. We'll, we'll take a look at this, um, this image a little closer in a minute. But did you take a look at your own sneakers or other people's sneakers in school? Look at the wear pattern here. This guy has a wicked wear pattern um, on the left foot. And it's not happening at all on the right foot. There's definitely something going on on the left side there. See that? Crazy, huh? Well, I say left side in the image here, you see it's on the right, but this is the left foot, the left shoe. Let's take a closer look at this treadmill. Uh, and so you'll see here uh, the what we see in a gait analysis, overpronation, underpronation, overpronator here. So the arch has collapsed here or needs some support. Um, this a roll we're rolling out here, and here is neutral. So overpronator, underpronator, neutral. Now, why do we care? Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm looking in the chat. Yes, okay, good, I'm glad I walked down the hall, good, I'm glad. That's typically what happens, we have, you know, we have you walk down the hall, uh, yep. 
way more worn on the outside. Yes, look at your shoes. You can see, look at your flip-flops. You can see that wear pattern. And sometimes even on the actual shoe itself, this is my, uh, my right shoe. Look at this divot where the, um, where the pinky toe is, right? Big divot, yeah. So I'm walking a little bit more on the outside of my right foot. So you can look at the bottom of the shoe. And these are also ways that we can assess where people may be tight. Let's take a look. Did you answer that question? We're not on the heels. Okay, good. So we look at these patterns. We look at the bottoms of the shoe to get an idea. Are they walking heavier on one side or the other? We show this to our client and we can see, and it may show up in their body. In this case, the underpronator, when walking on the outside of their foot, maybe they've got an arch support that's too big for them. Maybe they have a really high arch and they end up walking on the outsides. Maybe they have really tight hips and it just, it just feels better to walk on the outside of their feet. Um, we're gonna look at uh, their muscles and where that muscle pattern of tightness is. This can be an indicator. Overpronation when it's um, actually falling in Let's take a look at that foot. Let's do some work on that arch. Is that tender? Do they have um, plantar fasciitis? We can see it sometimes in their gait. So this is critical thinking. We're actually going into the assessment now, but I wanna take kind of step out and remember that you may get a question on simple gait analysis. This is, we are not necessarily doing a complicated an in-depth gait analysis. And you can see here, I'll move this down. So see yeah um this is an advanced gait analysis see all these points an advanced gait analysis you know oh they're videotaping and there's markers on the skin olympic athletes have this done high level athletes have this done i've had clients um who are elite runners go and have their running style uh assessed when i worked with u.s track and field this was a common thing to do to do an advanced gait analysis the scope of our practice as massage therapists, is what we've just covered. To take a look at shoes, to take a look at them walking. This is uh, also part of our postural assessment. Could be a gait analysis. And actually, you could palpate. Is it tender on that shin bone? You know, go ahead. If you're sitting down, go about halfway down your tibia, halfway down your shin bone, and sink your fingers behind it. Maybe sink your thumb in there. Assess it all the way up and down. Mine's feeling pretty good today. But that's often a place right behind the tibia where overpronators or underpronators have tension. It's the posterior tibialis. Yeah. Tell me in the chat if it's tight on you. All right. So these are different ways to do advanced gait analysis. But let's um, wind down this part of our this segment before we go into dissecting the questions with a quick review on soap notes. Subjective, objective, assessment, and treatment plan. So what are the symptoms the client is having? What's the client history? Um, these are things that are uh, uh, through the eyes of the clients. Objective is our assessment. Our objective visual assessment, palpation, um, in, uh, what we objectively see. High right shoulder, pronator, uh, has a funny walk. Maybe I, that's not really uh, scientific, but you notice something in their walk. Have you ever done that? Have you started doing that as a massage therapist now that you've gone to school? If I'm in Home Depot or Lowe's uh, or Ace Hardware, giving everybody some love, um, watch the people who walk through the store or through the grocery store. Oh my goodness, it's so interesting. Their gait, do they know they're walking so funky? There is something going on in that body, right? It's, it's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, Melissa. Yeah, so Melissa says um, that they, they see, she sees people walk up and down. Like, it's like, like, what's going on? Why are they walking that way? Like, you, you start to try and figure it out. That's your critical thinking kicking in. Boom. Yes. That's your assessment skills kicking in. Good job. Yeah. Uh, and so written data, you know, is what we're going to capture here. Um, our visual data is what we're going to capture here. 
uh, we covered EHR, electronic health records in another class, uh, but the assessment is written after the session. It's an assessment. What did we find? In our SOAP notes, assessment is after the session. A client assessment is the whole thing, right? But in our SOAP notes, it's after the session, what we've encountered in the treatment plan outlines what we think we're gonna to need to do going forward. It also gives us an indicator of when that client needs to return for their next massage. And I say needs to um, because you're the professional. Did this, did this massage probably help them? Likelihood is they're at least feeling better, right? In my opinion, once a month is a great maintenance schedule for clients, one time a month. You know, they travel a lot, they may only get in once every six weeks. But if you can shoot for 10 times a year, then that's, um, if you can shoot for 10 times a year, that's awesome for your clients. And you can share that with your clients. Share that once a month is what's recommended for healthy people to help you know, maintain health. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna mute myself for just a moment. Eva's coming in now. All right, Eva's coming into the classroom. All right, so give, do yourself a favor, do your clients a favor and recommend when their next session is coming back. It's always, you guys, it's always either two or four weeks. Always. Until it's not. Like I said, I see one client twice a week, every week. That's because that's the, the schedule that that client wants to keep. They love massage. It really helps them. But for the general population, every two weeks, every four weeks, just pick one. It's your call. It's not their call. I hear you. Oh, they'll tell me when they're ready. Sorry, I don't mean to be uh, say it in that way. A lot of uh, um, massage students, massage graduates, a lot of practicing massage therapists feel uncomfortable telling, asking their client, telling their client when they think they'll be ready for their next massage. You simply say, in my opinion. I want your opinion. If I'm your client, I want your opinion. I do. Please give it to me. In my opinion, you'll be ready for your next massage in four weeks. Okay, awesome, put me down. All right, I think you get it. That's called treatment planning. What's gonna happen you know, for, your, for your client? How are you going to uh, help be a part of their wellness team, their medical team, their wellness protocol? All right, we better get going. All right, dissecting questions. All right, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Yes. Don't you get excited about client assessment? I do. It is so much fun to work with a client proactively to foster health, to not only help them with their symptoms, but to improve their well-being. Oh, it's just great. It's, it's an awesome reason to be a massage therapist. Okay. Let's go ahead and get to the root of these questions and find our best answer. <laughs> what is gait assessment? What is gait assessment? So is it a hinged door to enter through a wall, fence, or a hedge? Uh, to watch uh, a person walk. To watch a person walk and observe any abnormalities and document or discuss with the client. To watch a person run on a treadmill. All right, I see some answers coming in the chat. Ooh, you're not distracted. Mm -hmm. You're not distracted? I see a lot of the accurate answers, yes. So we know that uh, we, so what is a gate assessment? Gate, G-A-T-E, is a hinged door, but that's not what we're talking about here. So not letter A. We use our test taking strategies, which is eliminate the wrong answers. Now, here's the tricky thing. 
each of these answers is right. But what's the best answer? You guys got it right away. To watch a person walk and observe any abnormalities and to document or discuss with the client. That is a gait assessment. To watch a person walk, sure, that's part of the gait assessment. To watch a person run on the treadmill, sure, that can be part of the gait assessment. But it's to observe any abnormalities and discuss with the client. Good job. You were not distracted. What do we do when, sorry, when do we do a client assessment? On the first client visit. On every client visit. When there's been a change in the client's health history. Only on the first visit. After that, it's the client's responsibility to inform the therapist of any changes to their health history. There's a few right answers in here. Oh, oh, I see you, I see you. Hold on just a moment. All right. So I see several answers. Oh, you got it. You guys got it. Yay. Yes. So uh, what I wanted to point out here is that it is not the client's responsibility to tell you about changes in their health history. It's our responsibility. So we know that one's wrong. So on the first visit, sure. On every visit, when there's been a change in the client's health history, I see you guys got it. Let her be on um, every visit. Yes, very good. So it is on every visit, even if it's only three or four minutes. Please let me reemphasize this again on every visit that we need to do a health history. We need to do a client assessment, just even what's been going on. I mean, have you been for a massage? I went for a massage uh, a while ago now um, to a franchise. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I love that there are franchises. I love that that's a place where you can go work. You can go work at a franchise right now at the front desk and be ready to become a massage therapist with them. It is so awesome to work at a franchise because you get to see what you like and what you don't like. And you never have to worry about marketing for clients. You will always be, have a full schedule. Yeah. But I went to a, a franchise and had an experience where the therapist didn't speak a lot of English. And so um, I just got brought, that, uh, that therapist, male therapist, brought me back to the treatment room, pointed to the table, and left. <laughs> me being me, I opened the door <laughs> and said, hey, did you want to ask me a few questions? And he said no, and closed the door. <laughs> what? I know. How, how are you going to be able to design your session if you don't know anything about me? Please, on every visit, do a client assessment. All right, come back. What are the components of a client assessment? Read the health history form and verbally review the doc and verbal verbally review the document. A visual assessment and notes on any muscular imbalances. A gait assessment and palpation assessment. All of the above. All right, what are your answers? What are the components? Are any of these what are these, what is involved? Read the health history form, verbally review the doctor, document visual. We don't always have to do that. Gain analysis, we don't always have to do with it. What's the best answer though? What's the best answer? This is what you're putting. Amber, I like it. Milka, I like it. Do we have to do that every time? No, we don't have to do that every time. But is it a component of a client assessment? Yes, it is a component. And so the correct answer, the best answer is all of the above. Yeah, did that trip you up a little? Good, yay, Melissa got it too, yay. Okay, good. All right, God bless you guys who are watching this on your phone. That's, that's ambitious. <laughs> all right, here we go. Next question, which of these are a general contraindication to massage? Psoriasis, fever, cancer, a badly sprained ankle, black and blue with swelling. 
You want to take a guess? Which of these are a general contraindication? Now, if you have an answer in mind, I see answers coming in. Mm -hmm. Be careful. We're looking at general contraindication. Difference between general and specific, right? General and local. So we're gonna eliminate one answer we know is wrong. And we know that cancer is actually not a general contraindication. So let me see, did anyone put, no one put letter C, good. Yep. All right, general contraindication. What is psoriasis? Skin condition, right? That's not the one, you know, psoriasis, which is the liver that is um, a liver condition. Psoriasis, this is a skin condition. Fever, you know what a fever is, badly sprained ankle. All right, let's see. Ah, you guys got there, yay! And the correct answer is letter B, fever. Now, you're saying Jody, but the black and blue ankle. Yeah, it's a local contraindication. Don't rub it. <laughs> it's going to be sore. <laughs> yeah. All right. If you have to hop off, go hop off. It's uh, 102, but we have one more question. Um, and then I'll stay on for a little bit uh, after class to see if you have any questions. But back to our general contraindication. Psoriasis, avoid the area. Fever, systemic. They might be sick. Their body's fighting something. Cancer, not a, it, it's actually beneficial, but not within 24 hours, 48 hours, really 72 hours. Pro, pro, the emblex, it's going to be 72 hours, but definitely um, not before, uh, right after. Pardon me for a minute. And we're back. All right, one last question. Then I guess it's time for me to be done. All right. A client comes to you with pain and dizziness when they turn their neck. They think the pain could be from a small MVA. What's an MVA? Motor vehicle accident. Um, when you perform your ROM, your range of motion testing, you notice um, extremely uh, extreme muscle weakness and they complain of difficulty swallowing. What should you do? Ooh, I put this question in at the last one. All right. What should you do? Go ahead and tell me. I'm not sure if I think I put an answer in here. I think I have. Let's see. What do you think? Ankle is local. Yes, that's right. All right. We know we're not sending them to another massage therapist. That's just passing the buck, right? <laughs> All right. What do we do? This is a very good example of an emblex question. It's long, it's weird, it has abbreviations. All right, I see your answer's coming. The best answer from our point of view, within the scope of, of our practice, is to thoroughly document the initial assessment and refer the client to a physician for further assessment before the treatment. Because what we're seeing here is a possibility of a concussion or whiplash. Yeah. So the best answer is letter B, thoroughly document our assessment, but let them know, unfortunately, when they've got this extreme muscle weakness, this difficulty swallowing, this is beyond the scope of our practice. Yeah, yeah. So. Best answer, letter D, letter B, be like boys. And that's a wrap. Yeah, that's a wrap. Uh, congratulations. Good job today. Good work. All right. So I am going to and just end the share and say good work. Good work in getting through uh, this tough topic of client assessment. Uh, this is some heavy stuff. Hey, this is what we came into it for, to actually do some good for our client and to do no harm, right? To do no harm, right? Okay, well, I'm signing off for now. My name is Jody Skulls. I am your instructor for the MVLEX review class. 
Uh, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in another class soon. Join me, uh, dig into the patron community. Um, if you haven't messaged me through your patron uh, site, uh, then go ahead and say hello, introduce yourself, uh, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. For those of you who are here on the recording, uh, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes and uh, see if you have any questions. 